Does that work? Does that give you sound? Still nothing. All right, hang on. I haven't done anything different. All right, y'all, hang on. I will restart it and then I'll get my guest in and we'll, and hopefully I can get back to the same broadcast. Hang on, y'all. Uh, are you all saying yes, you can hear me now? Oh, okay. All right, good. All right, now let me get my guest. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh oh. Still nothing. I think y'all hear me now. Do you hear me now with the computer? I don't know what's happening today. All right. Still nothing. Y'all still can't hear me? Yes, you are back. Okay, so maybe I just have to use the computer. Hopefully it doesn't have a kickback. Okay, everybody's saying they can hear me. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. My AirPods have been weird. Um, hopefully my guests can get in shortly. And then we can get started. Okay, all right. All right, y'all can hear me. All right, hopefully this, um, now I know I have a line through my face. I'm hoping my guest is dialing in shortly. Let's see. Make sure y'all can hear me. It's coming and going. Uh, I don't think I have another headset that's charged that I can use. Um. Okay, everybody saying they can hear me. Okay, I won't mess with the AirPods then. Can y'all still hear me? Okay, good now. All right, cool. All right, let me see where my guest is. Okay, good through the computer. All right, thank y'all. All right, so while I'm waiting for my guests, all right, cool, 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 cool. 
I don't know. I'll have to check on my AirPods. Happy Sunday, everybody. Hello, Cynthia. Hi, Linda. Good morning, Judith. Good morning, Kitty. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Like, sub, and share. Maybe I'll do my intro while my guest is coming in. Um... Kitty is saying it's windy. All right, as long as y'all can hear me, let me do my intro and then. Make sure, yeah, hello, day. All right, I'll do the intro while we wait for my guest. Hi, Noah. Happy to have you here. I guess it's two of you. If not, happy to have you joining us. All right, let me do my intro. And as I'm sure as soon as I do my intro, she'll, she'll sign in. So let's just see what we get. I'm not doing the intro because there we go. She's dialing in. All right. Ah. <laughs> So, so we're live. We are live. That is okay. I'm just happy you're here. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, hello. Delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have you. So I didn't do my intro. Y'all know what this is. Um, <laughs> um, Miss Bohemian Soul TV. We're always doing some inspiration, sharing some stories. Um, as I do this intro. Um, Oftentimes, it's not specific specific to tiny houses, but there's always a, a connection um, somewhere in there, and there absolutely will be the connection in this conversation. So um, thank you all for joining um, as you do. And, I, and I'll just say that, as, as I have always say, that I believe our homes tell a story about us, whether intentional or unintentional. And this story, like I just said, doesn't specifically involve tiny houses, but there's a big segment of housing involved in it and the intentionality and all of those things. So I feel like we're going to come back right back around to the conversations that that we're used to, to having in this segment. And because it's always bigger than the housing, like there's a journey, but housing kind of always ends up being the core. So I thank you for being here Um I had the beautiful opportunity. So um, I think it was 2018 when I first met Elizabeth at um, a tiny house event. And I hadn't seen Elizabeth in person since 2018. And I asked her maybe about a month ago to be a guest here. And then I saw she was going to be in D.C. Um, for an event with some of my other cool friends. So I was able to... Um, go to the event. Was that last week before last? Last week, week before last. The day, the days run together. Um, and surprise her because I didn't tell her I was coming. I kind of, uh, kind of made the arrangements in the background. So I was very happy to be able to connect um, with Elizabeth in person um, after having not seen her for so many, many years. So Elizabeth, please introduce yourself to the guests this morning, and thank you so much for being here. No, delighted to be here. And was that 2018? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. It yeah. Was six years, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. It's almost it's a lifetime. Yeah. I am, you know, sort of at an amazing place now, uh, having turned 70 in December, as I say to people, closer to the exit than the entrance. And um, I met you probably right after I had done a self-published book called 55 Unemployed and Faking Normal. And then I did one with Simon and Schuster, 55 Underemployed and Faking Normal, about the millions of older Americans who have not set aside the million plus dollars that you will need to maintain your standard of living in old age. Because what we know is if you make it to 60 and reasonably good health, chances are you're gonna live you know, well into your 80s, if not your 90s. 
And so many of us don't have pensions, have not set aside enough money to sort of uh, make it possible to live the way we're used to living. And I had my own experience with that, stepped on a banana peel, uh, kind of mid to late 50s and wrote about it. And wrote about it at a time when I was still feeling shame about it or embarrassed about it because we live in a country where um, you only talk about how you've succeeded. You only talk about the wins. And I thought what happened to me was maybe happening with me and a few friends of mine. And I wrote an essay describing what it was like to land here and thousands of people responded overnight. Okay, so, the back so, so yeah. don't go too far because I want to dig, okay. dig, in, dig into that. Okay. So I, All right. I have some questions about everything that you just shared. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes. Michelle, we're, we're going to miss you, but I listened to the replay. I'm glad you're here for a few minutes. Thank you so much. So stepping back, that and, and it's important because we were just talking about this here last week. The, give us a little bit of obviously whatever you're comfortable with. Give us a little bit of the situation you found yourself in. And what we were discussing last week is the fact that you're oftentimes in these situations and you feel isolated, don't feel like anybody else can relate to that situation. And you're just what you just said in shame and you're just suffering and you might suffer for a while and then sometimes you you let it out and you realize oh my god like this is this is something that's happening all over in yeah give us give so us a you know that if you can the title of my book there's 55 underemployed and faking normal mm -hmm. i use that term for a reason because i was pretending i was okay when i wasn't okay Mm -hmm. And I have the kind of background, I have all the props and credentials, Harvard, all the little union tickets, and it wasn't working. And, you know, you do the little informational interviews and you, you know, fill out the applications online and you still have pretty good clothes from when things were working. And so you're still trying to kind of fit in and you uh, going places, um, you know, scrutinizing the menu because you only have this budget, but right. you got to be there because you got to be, you know, on the scene talking to people. And, you know, so there was all of that. And uh, one of the things I, somebody said to me, uh, God works through people. And if you don't tell people what's happening to you, they're not going to know. And my fake was very, very good because I had the, you know, I lived in the place I'd been living. Now, if you came in, you'd see there was a hole in the ceiling and the carpet was a mess and the, 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 the uh, washer and dryer didn't work and all of that, but the address was the right address. Right. And I had still the clothes so I could look the part. And this is where the faking normal, pretending you're okay when you're not okay. And I had a couple of friends during that period who we must have borrowed the same $200 back and forth a dozen times. When I had it, you know, I owed it to her and then back and forth. And it was not knowing that this was happening to a lot of people because the fake normal, and if you have a good fake, cause you've got, you know, some of the clothes or whatever, or you got the car or whatever, uh, people are not going to necessarily mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we were talking about, how you can, you know, even uh, an actual illness, if you don't look the part, there there's oftentimes no sympathy given. Um, if you don't look the part, um, people don't understand. They're like, you know, what's wrong with you? Get it together. You look fabulous. Like they, they can't garner any sympathy for you don't physically, physically look like something is wrong with you. And the other thing I wanted to step back and I completely forgot this. So thank you for, um, 
Um, thank you, V. Cooper, for reminding me of this. You said 70, and this is this is the conversation we keep happening having over here. 70 where is is <laughs> somebody said something last week and I got totally off track when they shared their age and us. 70 where? So kudos to you. Um I I didn't realize you were at 70. I knew 55 that when you wrote the book that it was a few years ago, but I didn't realize you were at 70. Goals, goals, goals. Um so when you wrote before before the book, when you wrote the essay, you know her and you shared it publicly. Were you sharing it publicly as a release for you? Like what was your what was your intent? Was it a way to share with your circle to get out of that place of shame? Or was it always your plan as you shared it for it to be public facing? So I wrote it as a cathartic exercise for me, sitting on my grandson's bed, wrote it really in one go. And then I sent it off to uh, an online publication called Next Avenue. Okay. And not sort of kind of clear with a goal, but I did send it to them. Mm -hmm. And then they published it and it made its way to the PBS Facebook page. And they contacted me and they said, do you see what's happening on Facebook? Well, I wasn't even on Facebook. So in my embarrassment, the, the, the picture they had on their article was of an old white woman. I went online to uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, where you can just get images. Mm -hmm. I found that old woman online and I created a Facebook account with that old woman's picture. Oh my God. Because then I was still I was still hiding. I was still oh my God. not comfortable publicly being the person in that. So the, the old woman yeah. still gave me some cover to kind of be yeah private yeah and it really was what happens when there's um something goes viral like that there are the comments that people make two or three sentences and then i don't know how they do it but they will find your email address and in the email address when the emails i got hundreds where it's a page or a page and a half of this helped me. I didn't know that this was happening. I thought it was just me. So that then bolstered me that mm -hmm. there is room for a story that's not for the Brookings Institute writing it for, you know, Congress or, you know, think tanks. There's a story for people who are having this lived experience. And because I have uh, the background, I do, I can look at data. And that's when I realized, ooh, these numbers are huge. Mm -hmm. And we're not having this conversation. But it was bumpy there in the beginning for me because yeah. I was not. Uh, and you get people, oh, it's your fault. You, you right, know, you must right. Be and, you know, you're a failure. And why right. did you eat oodles and noodles? And, shouldn't be living in that neighborhood anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. All, How are you wearing all, those clothes, clothes that you've had well, for 20 something years? How are you wearing those clothes? Because they want right. you to look torn, torn up from the floor up. Like, floor up, right. yeah, they just throw your, throw your stuff out and just look raggedy. And then maybe I can feel sorry for you. No, all of that. All of that. Yeah. Yeah. So then the the stories start coming in and they become the the inspiration for your book that you self published, correct? Is that how that that happened? And what someone will then say, I'm coming to DC. Do you have time for a coffee? Okay. Okay. And then out of that grew some really close friendships of people that we met and then we started collaborating and really talking. And after a point I had, it was actually my brother said, you know, why don't you, you're, you're a writer, why don't you write about this? And there were a few men who talked to me and their stories were 
especially a few white men who had never experienced any sort of ism. Us as black women, we know gender discrimination, we know race discrimination, so age discrimination. We've kind of worked this muscle before, we know kind of what this mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. If you, you are a white man who's always, you know, right. on top, walked in yeah. on top for the first time, just on how you look, people are now discounting you. Absolutely. Uh, I had some conversations where, um, people were going out the door pretending they were working and their families didn't know yes. <laughs> that they were going to the library. So kind of, so all of the different kinds of stories, our stories as black women, um, people who, I, I remember once I was in a small town in Tennessee that the uh, chicken factory or something had closed. And I was speaking to those, the people this had happened to. And then I was at MIT at an event there, like a few days apart. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that it didn't matter if you'd lost your job at a chicken factory, if you had done what you thought mm -hmm. you were supposed to do, worked all your life. You know, I say use band deodorant, Crest toothpaste, didn't yeah. double part. <laughs> okay, did it all. All the right tax, things, right. All the right things that the shock and awe, the upset was the same as those people that I was, the high earners I was meeting at MIT. They were, you know, there were uh, marriages that fell apart around it. There was all of the feelings of shame and failure, whether you're drinking beer or a glass of Chardonnay. And when I saw those two groups of people close together like that, that's when I saw the similarity when the dream, the American dream does yeah. not, yeah, you know, unfold the way you thought it would and you thought it would. Yeah. The great equalizer. Right. So as you're starting to have these conversations, so before, so I have a question about the themes that you started seeing, but before I even get there, how this work, was it now pulling you out of that place of shame, like what, what did you have to do? Was there a process for you to now I'm, I, I see I'm not alone. Like how, what was your energy? What did you have to do for you to get to the place of now I see I've got so many people having the same thing happening and, and looks like there's some work for me here. What was that, that transition for you? So being able to speak candidly and have people respond with, I needed to hear this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you speaking candidly gave me permission to speak candidly to some other people who need to know what's happening, mm -hmm. that um, there were so many, Jewel who were in this situation, I started to hear, you know, I'd go someplace to speak or I'd hear from people who wrote me. Um, and I then could objectively see the numbers mm -hmm. that we are, you know, kind of facing a crisis here that we weren't addressing. So that sort of, that fueled me. Okay. So once I, um, the people who were, you know, kind of trolling me, yeah. the, the numbers yeah. were never big. They weren't big. And I have good skin density, you know, as well. So, you know, you're hearing them, but I didn't, the numbers who were supporting were way bigger. Overshadowed. So, and so you get to a place, because uh, this is very different than my background. My background's all international and development and Africa. So I didn't know about longevity. I didn't know about ageism. I was now completely in a different space. It was a reinvention of mm -hmm. sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody took me, there was a guy named Tony Sarmiento took me under his wing. Uh, I was... So he, someone recommended him and he's deep in the longevity space. Okay. Uh, and he took me 
around to the AARP events and the American Society, all this world that I didn't know. And he had been on various boards and he watched me for a long time because I think there was a little bit of, how did this happen to her? <laughs> Is there a scam here or something? So he watched me for a while, but when he felt like he could trust me, he just opened a lot of doors that would have taken me longer to get into some of those rooms. So you were healing, uh, your healing was happening as you started doing doing the work. So it was right. healing you as you were working to help other people. What And speaking of truthfully, <laughs> being able to talk, because um, I had been hiding a long time. I had been in the faking normal. Mm -hmm. uh, so even, you know, coming out more to my family, coming out, um, if you're, if you have a good fake, <laughs> they will not know. Will not ever know. <laughs> or, or <laughs> even if you're showing signs of it, I feel like if you're that strong person, you've always been that strong person, even when you're showing signs of it, people ignore it because they just expect, oh, you'll be, you'll get it together and you'll be okay. okay. Yep. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So the themes that you're that you're coming across and and there I have a question about this later on but what what are the themes that you're seeing how, how does it shape up across races and genders it, it, that you're finding initially what what does that look like that, was there differences that you were seeing So I saw I think the most shocking statistic for me was one um, that said educated black women had median wealth of eleven thousand dollars. I forgot what it was with white women, but way north of three hundred thousand. Mm. So um, that number was so shocking to me that I tracked down the researcher to just validate that I had not read that wrong. So what it said to me um, is our particular, you know, what structured, gendered racism cost us. Yeah. And in a dollar figure, it's about a million dollars in terms of discrepancies in uh, wages or wage disparity, what they're paid, what we're paid, it's a million dollars over the course of a 40 year career. So when you think of that, that's a house, that's education for your children, that's, you know, your rent, mm -hmm. that's so many things that would uh, put you in a different position than you're in. So kind of when I, um, started to see also what they call the forgotten middle. Mm -hmm. So these are, um, you know, we're going to get into housing, but with sort of senior housing at that five to $7,000 range market range, you have a lot of people make a little too much or have too many assets for government assistance. Right. Right. Cannot afford market rate housing for older adults. So that forgotten middle is not just us, but it's a lot of white people as well. And so I started to see these numbers and, um, and I would go to the uh, NIC conference, which is sort of the like trade association for senior housing. And the, the focus would be on that upper end, that 10,000 a month uh, luxury senior living. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where there's money there and not so much in what uh, is described as the forgotten middle. And that's kind of how uh, you said at the beginning with uh, tiny um, housing and housing, you know, it is our financial security. It is our stability. It is our... Um, you know, kind of where our sanctuary is. If that is not right. sorted out, nothing right. sorted nothing, out. Nothing. That's your whole anchor yeah. right there. And and to your point, like the, the focus on the people who have the money. So all of the commercials you see um, for retirement, you know, they're out playing tennis and jogging and walking through the park and traveling and exploring. And 
that absolutely is how you end up in that place of shame because for the the large majority of us that's not go, that's not our experience that's not going to be our experience and so you feel like that's what I'm I should be doing and uh, clearly I've done something wrong because that's right. not that's not where I am right and i think what drew me initially to tiny houses and how i found you because i you know i was drawn to tiny houses but i wasn't kind of feeling what i was seeing i was feeling, and then i saw you and then i thought oh i can do i could live there uh i told you when you come to dc and you come to my place you will totally see why i said that because tiny houses um it allows you to, you, you may not be doing all of what you just described, but there are ways to find, I have um, many friends now, we know where to go to spend $25 on Oh, absolutely, them. absolutely. Okay, okay. You know, hold, hold what, that thought, wanna... Elizabeth, because I want to ask you some more questions about the book before we go to Tiny yeah. Houses. So hold that, hold that thought okay. just a minute. I, there's some other things that are so, important in in the in the book that I want to talk about. So as you're as the way you've got the book written out, there's the community offering theme of the book. You ask people to gather and discuss in a resilient circle. And it's not just it's not presented as just a self-read. There's an encouragement to to gather. Why why is that so important? And and like, did you, it doesn't sound like you had that, but it, it, it sounds like as you started re the, this is the new release. As you started writing this, that was a key for you. And I feel like it's such a key as we get older. Why was that piece important? And I did have that. I did have my own okay. resilient circle. And okay. the reason for this is going through this is crazy making. You I, doubt yourself, you lose your center, you don't have uh, the confidence that maybe you had. And at the same time, you're still trying to find work. And what I started to see is if you don't have some place where you can tell the truth about what's happening to you, you carry that into interviews, you carry that into meetings. And people may not know exactly what's, what's going on here, but they feel mm -hmm. something is off here mm -hmm. and then they don't want to hire you or they don't want to collaborate with you or they don't want to. Mm -hmm. So what I found with my resilience circle, that was somewhere I could go and tell the truth about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, I had a like a little game in there where, you could, I could say, you know, my, my electricity is about to be turned off. Someone says, well, my cell phone is turned off to just the one get ups, out. The one ups <laughs> in, 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 the one ups in, in, in uh, tragedy, but <laughs> I can one up you. And because it, you then had a safe space to tell the truth. So then when you went out and you met someone, you weren't what I called leaking. Because I meet, I would meet people, they'd want to meet me for a coffee, and they're leaking all over the place. And I knew if I were interviewing them for work, and all of this was happening, all the intensity, then it is the person receiving it doesn't know what's happening. And so uh, the resilient circle was also good for Somebody in my resilience circle told me about a program that allowed me to uh, defer payment on my mortgage for over a year. Oh, wow. And somebody else, you know, uh, I told her about something she could get. Um, they would come into your house and, you know, she got one of those, um, the chairs you put on the steps that go up the oh, steps. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So she was able to get that. They, you know, fixed all her toilets so they were higher height. So there were all these programs that we found, there were like five of us, that we would share with each other. Because uh, it, it's hard to, since the 
country doesn't do a good job of addressing right. this right the piecemeal it together yeah hearing about this nonprofit that does a little bit and you know what your eligibility is uh for something else so with five people kind of looking at the same thing then you know a lot we were able to amass uh, resources that helped each of us in different ways yeah yeah the the community and i it just becomes more and more important as you live longer to to have that support system so chapter so there's some there's a lot of practical application as as you're just sharing like somebody told you how to do this, you share that. There's a lot of practical application shared in the book where you're talking about um, first owning the situation, like getting out of that place of shame and and addressing and owning that this is where you are now. I I need to do something about it. There's the chapter on borrowing borrowing money. And you spoke to that, you know, that same $200 and and sharing it around. And and that makes perfect sense. And somebody else, um, Teresa, I think, yes, Teresa just said, um, that makes sense to her. There's you talk about looking into benefits. What are your options? Are you eligible for housing assistance or or food assistance? And again, that is the part the 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 first step of owning it is so important because you may have had this pride all of these years to feel like that would never be me. And here it is. It is you. So own it. And then here are the practical steps to to um, start trying to to get yourself out of this place. Um, the, there's also the application of considering your work or your entre- entrepreneur, entrepreneurial um, in the struggle this morning, opportunities. What is it that you can do that maybe you've not considered? And then, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and what I call getting off my throne. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had to, you know, I you're used to, you know, I had to, you know, $25 bus to New York, I mean, all, you know, all of it, stuff that, um, and I, I tell her there was, uh, she wanted me to uh, help her with organizing. And I thought she meant organizing, like in the community, like what uh, President Obama did. She meant going around organizing people's closets. And I, I said, well, I'm not doing that. And she said, get off your throat. You need to, you don't, you need money. Yeah. Come help me do this. So there, you know, there's kind of all of the, the, uh, pieces, the borrowing money is excruciating. And I always say to people, yeah. if I ask you to borrow some money, I am at my very last because I have been outside looking in the grass trying to see if I have I can find no, some no cushion. <laughs> well, before I get to the point where I'm asking. So if I ask, please know that I have exhausted all opportunities. Yeah. And I'll tell you something now, uh, in the way that um I uh, and, and particularly if you're someone who you hate being beholden and indebted, yeah. oh, yeah, excruciating. Yeah. And so I, uh, you know, here and there, friends get into situations. I now do not ask for a long, you don't even have to tell me why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to trust that if you're coming to me, yeah. you need the money. And we just agree on the time it comes back, but there's something, there's some loss in dignity. Yeah. Uh, when someone, well, you know, it, so yeah. I and yeah. I also will sometimes, if I can, uh, somebody asked me a few months ago for a thousand dollars to lend them. I couldn't lend the thousand, but I could give them five hundred, because sometimes that loan does not yeah. really help. It doesn't help. Yeah. So kind of, you know, how can you hold in grace? How yeah. can you hold the relationship intact? Right. Uh, once you introduce that money borrowing, the whole <laughs> thing. Dynamic changes, into, shifts. Absolutely. Changes. And so kind of, uh, I wanted to do a chapter on that because I had seen 
you know, a lot of dynamics there that, uh, including I spoke about Elijah, who is uh, my friend who's barefoot and no, who's the one who, who lent me $5,000. And he, it was, you know, you'd see him, you'd never think that that's the one. You know, so there's a lot of uh, kind of, you have to work through um, honestly where you are. And I talked because people, you know, food stamp. I get the yeah. food stamp. Yeah. yeah, it's out there. If that's what, if that is what you're it's it's going food. to secure your, if you're in a free fall, you're holding on to those things that will help you to, uh, anchor so that you can, you know, regroup. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and like you said, I love it. Get off your throne. Um, and, and it takes a lot like it. I, I'm, I honestly can say I'm in that place right now, having to talk myself through for, because I've always been the person to help others and finding myself in a position where I now need more help than I'm used to. It is a whole exercise in my brain of, going back and forth and being okay with, with and asking and, and putting myself out there in that place of vulnerability, because it's a lot. Um, in addition to whatever the, whatever the need is or whatever the ask is. So now you got to deal with the emotional part of just like what you said, asking um, to that need. And here's the thing. When I said, when we first started the person, she's a minister who said to me, God works through people. They can't help you if you don't tell them. Right. I may know about the perfect apartment for you. Right. But if you don't tell me or the perfect whatever for you, that's right. I just talked to someone at told, but you didn't tell me. Yeah. So I don't even know to mention it to you. Well, is it closed so my that, house get fed? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Chapter 10, you talk about, so you talk about San Miguel and that is on my list to go. Like I really want to spend time there, but chapter 10 is, is big for me. And, and I feel like it's the big movement. It is what my friends are doing of thinking outside the country. So I'm, I'm a shout out my friend, Charlotte Van Horn. She's black expats. Yeah. And grandma. Um, Rashida Dowd and Stephanie Perry, the Exodus summit. That is what they're doing because they're focusing on, not just leaving the country, but finding ease and abundance and, and leaving and not waiting till it's retirement age, leaving now so that you can care for yourself and not have to wait till you get to despair and, and have the life that we are intended to have. Because like you said, you know, earlier, the American dream isn't our dream. It is not, it is not what it is sold to be, especially for our community. So Focusing on that, I feel like is is a big thing too, and that's not always been an option for us to even consider. Yeah, I uh, there was a woman, Bonnie Black is her name. She wrote me, and she had been a New Yorker. She was a caterer. She was doing well, and then just could not put it together in New York. New York is expensive, and went to San Miguel first on a visit and then eventually moved there. And she wrote me and she said, look, you need to come down there. There are a lot of solo age or single women who are moving to San Miguel. It's much more affordable. So I um, went down there to see her. She organized a lot of different meetings for me. And I met women who were living on $600 a month I think the highest one was $2,400 a month. And um, and they were sort of, you know, kind of upset that San Miguel was getting on the map because too yeah. many people were coming <laughs> yeah. as raising the yeah. cost of living there. Right. But it was magical, you know, on a lot of levels. One, just um, the uh, Mexican culture and their view of older women in particular. Oh, wow. Uh, so that many older American women said they felt more seen there than they felt here. Wow. I remember speaking with a woman, she had uh, some, uh, uh, her eyesight was diminished. And she said she never felt like worried crossing the street because they, they're accustomed to seeing you know, older women are not invisible. 
Mm. And just, I heard that over and over again. And then meeting black women who had also gone there to live. So kind of um, in the book, I wanted to hear kind of all the things that people are considering uh, cause I'd say the Calvary is not coming to no. the rescue. Here. Right. You know, no. we are going to have to do it ourselves. Right. Um, San Miguel just looks like peace. When I look at the pictures, I have three friends who live there and it just looks like peace. And the, the thing that stands out for me as I travel is that part about the, the respect and reverence of, the of older people. I always, and I think I said this last week to the group, you always see um, the young, young boys and the young kids holding out their arm for, is it the abuelo? I think that's the word holding the arm and, and helping, you know, walking. And sometimes it's not a physical thing. It is just the, uh, I respect and I love you. And I'm listening. What it, you always see them in conversation or the families in the park and you see multi-generational families in the park spending time together. And to me, that is just like, oh my God, we don't do that in the U.S. But we always think the U.S. is the greatest country there is, but we're missing out on, yeah. and when I say we, I'm not talking about me or the, uh, most of the friends I know, the, the proverbial we, but we're missing out on so much that is important that is just natural in, in these other places. Now, I, I remember so clearly watching, it was an older woman with her two daughters and a son. So uh, each daughter had a, an arm helping her up, step up, and the son was behind her. It was just like a Sunday afternoon. And um, the community piece, you know, because we're here pushing individualism. Everybody needs their yeah. own vacuum cleaner, their own snow blower, their own car. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what and it's just not going to be sustainable. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so that now, uh, how do we think differently about what it's going to mean to be an older person in the U.S.? There's got to be something between, you know, under a bridge with cat food right. and, right. you know, wind blowing on your yacht. Right. <laughs> drink champagne. Right. There's some, you know, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Some, some happy thing. median in between those two yeah. extremes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So chapters 11 and 12, I feel like they correlate to everything I feel like I represent. So the chapter 11, retirement security requires housing security. That is, again, the anchor. That is the everything. That is the, the biggest expense. That is, it, it relates to, so as I, th as I thought about that chapter, um, having had my TIA in December, if I didn't have my, my tiny house is saving my entire life right now. The non expense of living, my my income is reduced, my mm. all of the things. And when I when I said my tiny house was my retirement plan, when I built it in 2015, it was I wasn't in that position. Now I'm in that position. And the words, a friend of mine echoed my words. My words are really really happening. Thank, thankfully I have the house, but it is saving my entire life right now. Um, wow. literally. Yeah. And, and that is the, the, the stuff that you talk about in chapters 11 and 12, housing just being our bigger, biggest expense and how it's often the thing that drags us down because it's so expensive. Yeah. Uh, and really thinking about what do we need? What do we really need to be content? And, um, you know, when you came up with Christine uh, Platt of Afro minimalism was also there. And I don't know if you said this to me or she said it, this thing where you put all your clothes, you have the hangers facing yeah. one yeah. way. Yeah, we were talking about that. Look at what when you wear something turning it around mm -hmm. um you know yeah and so many um 
things that, you know, we live where we are what we buy. That's how we who we are know, deal with yeah. boredom. That's how we deal with stress. Yeah. Uh, of, and then I think as um, African American women, you know, we're taught. Uh, you know, we had an interesting conversation last week with Lynn Slater, and I talked to her about you know clothes and the power of clothes. And yeah. uh, I know that uh, dressed a certain way, I will be treated a certain way mm -hmm. in certain environments, and mm -hmm. you know, kind of all of that. So. Initially, the whole, I said, before I saw you, I was, you know, kind of intrigued by the minimalism, but not totally drawn. It, it felt a bit spare to me, a bit, you know, I couldn't feel the soulfulness in it. And I thought that, you know, you've given us, uh, and even someone can have, you know, a different uh, style. Your style and mine are very similar. But what you gave was permission to choose what you love. Oh wow! And you, you, you know, kind of hone around that. Whereas the minimalism I was seeing, sort of in the mainstream, was sort of prescriptive and just yeah. formulaic. It didn't yeah. speak to you as a, a person. Yeah. And I'm talking about older people, so who definitely have a point of view. Uh, so I'm, I feel uh, like there is an opportunity to live well in a smaller space and not feel it's all about loss and deprivation. Yeah. Is that, that's, you know, I yeah. think on the, uh, the other kind of minimalism makes people feel like it's mainly about loss and deprivation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So shouting out Christine, um, less is less is liberation, and she and I kind of I when I I was I had the honor of being in her book, um, and my th and I told her she asked me about how what it felt like to live in a tiny house, and I said it's freedom. Less is freedom for me, um, and so she's less is liberation, and it is a, a freedom in and and it's not just the smaller home; it is a freedom in. And the conversation I, I started having with my mother um, in, you start collecting things as an older person and you have a, a, a pile of papers, you have stuff you're not looking at because, you know, as, as the other thing that starts happening as you find yourself spiraling in these spaces is you start ignoring stuff. And so then the piles start happening. And I always tell somebody, to understand when I am off kilter, you can look at my house. The, if the piles are happening or something like that, then something is not because I, I'm, I'm in, an, in a, an avoidance place. And so what happens, you don't have the energy, the bandwidth to deal with stuff. And so stuff starts piling up and going through that decluttering process. And I always shout out Christine in her book. But go, if going through that decluttering process for papers, for all of the things, not just your the size of your house, is absolute liberation. You feel a, a, a weight off of your shoulders. Right. And I share that in, I'm not a minimalist. Like my, my house is probably on the maximalist side <laughs> because I have all the things in here, all the things that I love. But it's small, but it is translated for me in the way I move about the world, the way I travel. I'm yeah. not the big, big suitcase person anymore. I can travel yeah. with, you know, a couple of things, a backpack that that is a, a weight that has has lifted off of my shoulders in. And it just kind of has it has taken over my life in in this process. Um, before we we go to tiny houses. You, you talk about multi-generational homes and, and the fact that that is, that's really a foreign concept for us in the United States and people outside of the United States are like looking at us like, what is your problem? Like, why don't you get this? Why? Or, or we make jokes about the fact that Mexican people come here and it's, we'll make a joke. 20 of them live in, in one house. They're all working. They're making money. They're saving money. All, all of the things, but we don't take that seriously. 
And this is, um, I think uh, it's about 20% of American households are now multi-generational and not just, it used to just be immigrant families, but post great recession, et cetera, many more families are finding that that is a way to live. But I think you are absolutely, I was um, at a dinner a few years ago, there was an Italian woman there who was mentioning that her son lived with her, her adult son. There's many, oh, failure to launch. <laughs> all this yeah, right, right. And she was like, what is wrong with you Americans? That he is working, we get along well, we want him there, he's saving for whatever. Uh, it was just peculiar to her that your adult uh, offspring living with you was so such, you know, viewed as such a failure statement here. And the truth is we are this blip of the nuclear family. Before that, it was all, you know, extended family. I, I think of even my uh, grandparents on my father's side died and his two siblings came to live with us. My grandmother mm -hmm. lived with us for 25 years. I mean, that was, uh, we're not gonna, you know, put them in foster care. Right, right. So, um, and I think for many of us who are living alone, we have our chosen family, right. you know, of people who, um, you know, I do uh, the holidays now, I do a dinner with chosen family. That's who, you know, I'm mm -hmm. inviting over who's coming and, you know, having dinner here. So the, you know, American, uh, sort of uh, the virtue of you got to do it by yourself. Right. You need bigger. You need more. Right. You need you know, that is uh, that's not going to work for most of us. And so the uh, making our path, I call it making our path by walking. That's what I you know see I'm doing and you're doing and figuring out what is another way for us to have a community to have a richly textured interesting life on less yeah yeah and um and i see us now starting to be drawn to each other that we you inspire me i inspire you i want to talk to christine you yeah. know so yeah yeah yeah, so I saw someone ask in the chat um, about Christine's book, and it's Christine Platt. Her book is The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. Um, and then just because I have, I, this is, can you all see it? Yeah, this is Elizabeth's book. So two books. I'll, you know, I share all the links, so I'll update the um, video description and add the link to both of those books um, here. But those those are the books that we're talking about. Um, so the only issue I took with the book on page 2225, you say, Des designing a tiny home that's too posh, though, defeats the point. No, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. I was talking about the, uh, I think I saw a $2 million tiny home. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure who she's talking to, but no, ma'am. So... <laughs> And so I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, because when I was designing my tiny house and thinking about tiny house living, and I um, I knew I was, so this was 2012, 2013, um, none of my circle understood what I was talking oh. about. Everybody, to your point, was, are you having hardship? Do you need a place to stay? Do you need a room? And I'm like, no, I got a whole plan. Um, but then when I was designing my house and kind of looking around in the movement, obviously nobody looked like me. And they were downsizing to the point of four shirts, two pairs of pants, and <laughs> you don't spend more than this on the tiny house and you don't do this. A lot of them were so much younger than me. And my thing was, like you, I've lived in some really nice spaces. I've got a closet full of clothes. I'm, I still work in corporate America. I want to go to my closet, get my clothes and get my shoes and walk out of my house and, and not 
be lifting up my car earrings are dangly earrings. Right. <laughs> I, and I, that's when I had locks. I got to be able to do my hair. I, I, there's so much I have to do in my house. And if I design this house and I feel like I go backward, I'm not going to be happy. And that's not going to work for my psyche in feeling like I've gone backward when I've lived in some really nice spaces. So I'm not, and my tagline is you don't have to give up luxury to go tiny. I'm not doing those things because that's not going to lead to my joy. And I right. saw my house as my long-term retirement plan. So I knew how important it was going to be to design it so that I could absolutely love it for eternity. And so I thank you. Um, and when I designed the other thing, so I remember when my house hit and a, a white woman commented and she said, finally, a woman has designed a house that we can all get behind. <laughs> and, <it was> just... <laughs> and so I knew... It was going to appeal to women. I also knew it was going to appeal to black women. One, because they hadn't seen a black woman. And because I'm not saying we can't have our style because we have to have our style. That is that is who we are. And 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 that is. um, And so I do get a shout out in in the book on page 229. So there's a there's a shout out about Miss Gypsy Soul. So I I appreciated that. And I think. When we first met, you mentioned that there had been a shout out that you had seen me. Um, and so I I appreciate that because, and I've seen in the chat where people have said, I gave the permission to dream. And I'm happy about that. But it was really just me dreaming for myself and sharing that. But again, not knowing other people are out here having this same challenge and, and need to see somebody else doing this or need that community of of somebody doing that. Yeah. And I can't wait until there's a community of us, you know, that that's, um, yeah. 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 That, that's the dream and yeah. goal for me. Yeah. I have to say this is, I can't remember feeling so connected in an interview. Oh, wow. I can't remember. I do. I've done a lot. I just feel at home with you. I feel like I get you. I feel gotten by you. You know, I'm going to be looking for ways for us to collaborate on Absolutely. something. I just, um, Absolutely. you know, from the beginning, you know, Absolutely. really Absolutely. are charting a path. So you already know I'm a crier, so don't make me cry, Elizabeth. <laughs> but absolutely. There is for me. There is so much honor in having you here. I just adore you. I've I adore. I've adored you um, since you were sitting in the audience. Because of course I'm in the audience, and I keep looking on. Like, Who is that lady with that hair over there? And I keep looking. It's just I got to know who that lady is. And then it was just the the energy and the connection. It's like I just adored. I've just adored you since 2018. Um, and the connection that you came around, like with with Dom through Dominique, and I adore adore Dominique. So you've been family, um, even though we haven't hadn't seen each other until just recently since 20 2018 ish. So so thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. I, and I love that, yeah that you hosted that evening before because that was important. That was my first experience going to a tiny house like conference. And then there was a gathering, yeah. a meeting before the meeting. Yeah. 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 Because me getting into the movement, and I feel like this is going to be a good segue for my next question for you. It was the, like, I felt like we were doing, doing something good. We were going to challenge the status quo of housing. And then I recognize, and, and if we're challenging the status quo of housing, I keep saying that. So we need to be talking about the people who aren't included in the conversation, the black and brown people, the unhoused, this, the, the, the senior people. And as I started trying to do that and talk about, okay, so where can I put a tiny house is the problem, but I'm also running into where can I put a tiny house and I don't have problems with racism and let's talk about that. And then I realized they don't want to talk about that. And then they want to get mad. Why do you always have to bring race into it? What? Like, okay, so I need to connect with different people. I don't need just the tiny house festival. 
I need to connect with the community that gets me. I need to connect with the people that I need to be talking to that are where I am and that can relate to my journey because coming behind me, I know someone in a tiny house on wheels, a black person is going to have that same challenge. So just like you said, it's sharing of resources and and paving a way to say, you're going to run into this so that you don't have to be surprised like I was when I'm sitting in my house thinking, are they really outside saying the N word? Like, is this really happening? So (laughs) what, 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 like, no, and, and for a second, and I've said it for just a second, as I got excited about the movement, I forgot I was black. And, it was just, and so now y'all are going to remind me, oh, I'm black. And so there, there's, and that, so the, in the co-housing, when you start talking about co-housing, and I want to, we're going to come back to tiny houses. You said um, that there was a sentence, a, a statement that you made the very, and co-housing and race. The very people who could benefit are priced out. And that is that is our conversation. That is the same conversation for tiny houses. The same communities that can benefit benefit from tiny houses are priced out. And it's and then you have people will come over and say, why does it always have to be about race? Because it always (laughs) is. It's right. Mm -hmm. It always is. And that, and and your, your work in the co-housing space, you're finding that same thing that, that we kind of have to claw our way into stuff sometimes. Yeah. So I, uh, two years ago, I was invited to join a venture studio, um, uh, Mm a startup to be a startup incubator. Mm -hmm. And it was a, you know, some are like little hackathons, 5,000. Now this one, they were going to invest 800,000 to a million per person, five of us. Uh, I was the oldest by far. I was like grandma Moses in there and they were going to fund an idea. So I had been sounding the alarm for a long time on the retirement income crisis. And now they were saying, so what do you want to do about it? If you could do something. Mm -hmm. And um, it just all the things you've said about housing and all that I was seeing about loneliness and isolation Mm -hmm. before the pandemic, during the pandemic, all that I was seeing about financial fragility and the need for affordable housing. And I was seeing in D.C. and in urban areas, co-living spaces for young people, nomads, Uh, you know, kind of folks living kind of in the gig economy, et cetera. But I hadn't seen anything that could be specifically designed for us. And so I told them, this is what I'd want to work on. And since I had, you know, this was in-kind and in-cash resources, I could hire architects and I could hire shared living experts and I could go to Amsterdam to the, you know, this big co-living conference and be on a panel there and uh, think about how this could benefit. And it's going to be a lot of women. I mean, we live already five, six years longer than they do. So sometimes even if you're in a couple, you're going to have some years where you are by yourself. And kind of walking this path now with uh, some renderings and a, you know, investment deck and talking to people uh, to see um, how and where I get up a building that would be multi-generational. Because so many people are saying, look, I don't want to be on an island of old people. <laughs> I want, you know, in the building, people of all ages. So... I'm feeling on the cusp of something. I don't know, kind of, you know, when you are like us, we throw spaghetti at the wall, okay? And we, you know, uh, there's a kind of way that we're moving. I don't know kind of where the conversation is or who, but I have been stepping and then the ground is there. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm in that space. I know this is a good idea. I'm hearing from so many people that, in fact, I used to say, you know, late 50s to 
you know, maybe 75, then a very cool 81 year old woman, why are you counting me out? Right. And I'm right. Thinking, right. You know, let me, um, and I, and this is for, yeah. um, when I think of who, who I'm thinking of solo agers. So a solo ager could be someone divorced, widowed, never married. You may even have adult children who is not, they're not in a position to help you either can't or won't, whatever it is, you are aging alone. It's for someone who is in reasonably good health. You may have a chronic condition or two that you are managing with medication, but you're not sort of in assisted living. You are likely working. I think a lot of times they don't think of us as working. Many of us feel like we're yeah. facing a work for a lifetime Absolutely. You know, situation. And so we might in this space want a co-working space. They don't think of senior housing and co-working going together. We have, you know, I'm thinking of people who have chosen family, uh, may not have the sort of traditional family that we're talking about. And we know there are easily 27 million people who are in this uh, category. So in housing for older adults, in the same way that tiny house is a new category that there's innovation happening, uh, I think there can be innovation in co-living. When I'm talking to the architects and I say design for older adults, I don't mean throwing up a bunch of grab bars everywhere. Right. And saying, <laughs> okay, that's it. No, you gotta you want you gotta be more thoughtful right. about kind of what what can this look like? And I want, you know, the aesthetic to be there and uh for you know, so we're uh I have uh uh, some real estate people, I call them my favorite rock throwers because we're all, they initially went, oh, we just do dorms. <laughs> I'm like, no, this, no. No, no. let's not just this, do dorms. It's not working, it's you not. know. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one in here. It's going to, it's totally off topic. Yvonne, I'm happy to see you in the chat. Yvonne says, this don't have nothing to do with the current conversation, but y'all look fabulous. The salt and pepper crowns are giving me so much life. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. I'm happy to see you in the chat. I do want to step back. I have some more questions for you. I do want to step back and say thank you for the, the feeling of connection. Um, my community, I will say, is amazing. They're always engaged in the conversation and they... They, they have been saving my life lately because I'm in that same struggle of, and we talked about this, finding community. Um, as I have moved my tiny house out on a friend's farm and I am in the middle of nowhere, my community is, is about 12 cats out there and some coyotes and stuff. Um, is, and I don't really want to be in community with the coyotes. Um, so it is the the finding the people who support you and can relate and help you um, move the needle forward in the, in the work that you're doing. And I feel so much like you, um, especially with this health challenge that I've just had and, and knowing what I need to do to take care of myself and, and the spaces I need to avoid and the, and, and the spaces I want to go into I feel just like you, like I'm on the cusp of something like, you know, I go back and forth some days when I'm sitting here thinking, Jewel, what the hell are you doing right now? And I, I also I just feel that energy. I am on the cusp of something great and it's something is about to happen. So I can relate to that 100 percent. And I'm glad that you out of all the interviews you've you've participated in, you feel that energy here. So I, I thank you yeah, so much. Being absolutely. Here. I so agree. you you started talking about the work that you're doing, and I know that to be new age, yes. the, the work that you're doing. So talk to us about new age. Talk to us about Amsterdam, and you talk it, uh, talked a little bit about it, but expand on, on that for us. You know, so um, as I said, in the uh, startup incubator, uh, and most of the, there were five of us, everybody else was doing tech pretty much. And then I wanted to do housing. So, you know, they really worked with me on that because they were not set up for that, but they, you know, uh, 
paid for me to get somebody, uh, a real estate developer to work with me and, you know, look at what I was doing and be what I called my favorite rock thrower. Cause I had all these ideas and sometimes they, you know, push back on you and you still need to push back because there's conventional thinking. And sometimes when you're coming into a field new, you just think differently. Right. And um, so I uh, have finished that uh, program and I got sort of a first chunk of money to keep going, to hold my team together. And I'm now in the process. There are a couple other things that I've applied for. One would be fantastic because it's just an incubator that's on affordable housing, which would put me like in the heart of the network of who I need to meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, just now going, building the community online, I'm, I'm working with someone who, you know, I was like not doing Instagram and she just <laughs> <laughs> made me yeah. do it. And then uh, so much engagement there and an opportunity to really ask a community, what are you looking for? And, you know, what needs to be in this? I've had some people say, we don't need that. We only need one, the one big kitchen that we're all sharing. And some say, no, I want a kitchenette that mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. need a little bit. You know, I can engage, but I want to be able to disengage. So the community that we're building now uh, online also helps validate this. Because, you know, we're going to get people who say, well, older people really live in something like this. Or are they interested in it? And to have thousands of people say, we want this, mm -hmm. that's a good validator. Mm -hmm. To have people signing up. You know, I want to get to where people can sign up actually for, you know, this space is going to be ready at this time in Atlanta or in D.C. Yeah, yeah. And sign up to um, be in it. So we're um, I, we're at early stage, not like total um, when this was just an idea. And I'm now kind of moving in the circles where um, sort of the next chunk of funding is really getting our, uh, I would call it prospectus together. Okay. Well, it's, you know, we have uh, one that is at a certain level, but we need like the next sort of refinement of the architectural drawings, more market research. We're kind of in that phase, which um, I'm feeling confident that that money is, you know, near. Good, good. So how are you feeling personally? Um, now, and this is, yeah, because I'm 70. Okay, so here I am. 70 where? Uh, 70 where, but you okay, know, where, you, where you are, um, and this is where we are not necessarily our parents and our grandparents. Yeah. Um, I am meeting women in their 60s and 50s doing all kinds of things, not yet ready, not done yet not ready to move off the stage. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at um, love to find some uh, young person, maybe 45, 48, that I can kind of in a legacy thing, pass this on to. She meant I want to say 50, a 50, 56, 57 year old y'all. That's she didn't mean to say, say that she, she was talking about me. I I'm not the young person, but she, she meant to say me, but go ahead, Elizabeth. I, you know, sort of someone who, cause you, you wonder, I'm just turning 70 and I'm hearing from people, oh, this decade is different than the sixties decade. And mm -hmm. I used to say to my colleagues in the incubator, they'd be talking about, you know, this is a 10 year commitment. I've said, I'm 80 in 10 years. No, we're not, I'm not trying to be doing this 10 years from now, but I do want to get it up and going. Yeah. yeah. And I do think in terms of legacy and who, you know, keep your heel in the door for who this will be an opportunity. They can go 10 years or longer. So all of that is kind of where I have, uh, 
landed and what I'm, uh, you know, just sort of staying loose in my spirit of, cause I don't know where the wisdom will come from. I don't know how the person will emerge. So since I don't know, then I'm lots of conversations, exploring with lots of people. That's yeah. kind of where I am. Yeah. And kind of for me, like I have said over the last few years, for me, my the next the work that I want to do next in this movement is absolutely community as well. From taking tiny houses to just from individual solutions. I need a house and and this is my house to how, what does this look like for community, building community. And so I absolutely understand um the the next moves that 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 you're making and I also see it as the same vision for tiny houses because um as much as I am a introvert and as much as I'm I I like to be alone, I also recognize the older I get I, there has to be some community, even just from a safety perspective. Um, yeah. So there's there's that big piece of it. And you need to have people around. Like my having that mini stroke and being out here and not being able to alert anybody. And and I know, I know um, and, and I've joked before that happened. I, I used to joke with myself when I was out here doing something stupid on a ladder or something. It was like, Jewel, you can't fall because by the time they figure out you're dead, they would, it'll be a carcass. The, the birds will have gotten you. These damn cats that you feed, they're going to eat you up. and be like, well, oh, well, we tried to wait for you to get up, but now <laughs> we got to take advantage of this opportunity. So it is, it is absolutely a need for community as you get older from, from that perspective and from a mental perspective, that engagement that you need with other people. It is no, absolutely yeah. necessary. I, yes. Uh, and I think uh, we don't, again, because of the, the culture we live in, of you should be able to do it on your own and you don't share uh, any vulnerabilities, then uh, what is a natural feeling of I'm not in community or I'm not connected um, gets interpreted as somehow I'm the failure here. Right. And when it actually it is a natural uh, need that we have as human beings. And right. how to, you know, when I think of... Um, you know, my own sort of need. So I'm not like when I think of the community that I'm wanting to build, I'm not saying, you know, it's, you know, we're all, you know, because you have to allow older adults, you know, sometimes we want to engage, sometimes we sometimes you don't. don't. Absolutely. And, um, and I have a number of friends who are introverts It's sort of, you know, how do you make space for people who uh, really get fueled also by their, Long. I've had more than and said, you know, yes, the pandemic was terrible in a lot of ways, but in some ways for them, it yeah. was really Absolutely. a place that, you know, allowed them to go in. You know, Absolutely. Go in without, Absolutely. Uh, without a lot of questions. Right. But, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I can relate to that 100%. I also think that this conversation, and somebody mentioned it a, a bit in the chat, I think this is a conversation that we have to keep having in our community because, um, and it's in our DNA, we're not oftentimes uh, um, community gathering. There's we're, we're not always in that space. We're often in, I need to go off and do this alone, or I'm going to hold this information to my keep to keep it to myself because I need to do this. I don't want to share it. I don't want somebody to take it. And it's not always our fault. I always say, you know, we were, we were given a raw deal with enslavement and so much of that is in our DNA, but we have to start challenging that and having these conversations. And it's the same conversation like tiny houses. I always say tiny houses is a hard sell for black people when you haven't had, and when you're chasing that American dream and somebody's now talking about a small house and you're like, I haven't had the big house and what the hell do I want to do? Laura Ingalls little house on the prairie. Like I'm, I'm not do any of that. 
And so right. it is, but just to your point a few minutes ago, the pandemic has shipped it because there was an awakening that a lot of people had in, oh, this is this is going left really, really quickly and I need to, to revamp. So tiny houses and, and, and co-housing and co-living isn't such a foreign concept anymore because for some of us, the light bulb went on to say, I can't do this by myself. I need right. community. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what have you learned about yourself in this journey? What, what has this journey taught you? Hmm. I think the, um, the whole process of being public with what happened to me um, has made me, how would I even put it? I notice now when I'm at uh, a restaurant with a group, I've learned to be able to read mm -hmm. something is happening because I'm paying it. You did that to me. Yeah. yeah, I pay attention and I pay attention to what's said and what's not said mm -hmm. um, because that's what I needed that wasn't always happening. I think you said it when you're perceived as strong, mm -hmm. people kind of look, you seem okay, you're always okay, uh, and they don't notice. Mm -hmm. So one thing is really noticing and um, making sure that there's uh, transparency and that we stay connected. Mm -hmm. So I don't like things building up. I like to you know, sort of sort things out as they're happening. I think also... Um, I was in a situation a few months ago where there was, um, uh, I needed to approach somebody that I thought had blown me off. They had a big position and, uh, and I remember standing in the room, I could either cross the room or not cross the room. And I just said, I'm going. There, there's something that comes with <laughs> when you're 70 yeah. that, you're just going. It's you the know, time. It's time. It's yeah. time. Yeah. It's just time. And and you, um, you know, sort of a clearer understanding of what your boundaries are. There's so many things that you've seen before. You can sort of fast forward. Uh, I was in a situation where the way this deal was beginning uh, there's a, I can't remember, there's a French expression that says the way something begins is the way it's going to end. Right, right. So there, there was a way that uh, just not being responsive, that you um, realize you can stand facing a closed door or you can turn around. And sometimes we can face a closed door for months or years and we're lamenting it and we're in regret. Mm -hmm. And we then don't notice mm -hmm. what would happen if we mm -hmm. turned around. Mm -hmm. So I was in a situation where there was a closed door. And turning around did not know that all of this that has unfolded would unfold. And you know, from the, you know, self-publishing to something with Simon & Schuster, I did a TEDx, the TED people invited me to put it on the main stage, this, you know, um, uh, venture studio, the incubator I was in. And some of that is also being open to advice from all sources, every age. And I find at this age, often the opportunities come from people who are much, much younger because they're still in the game. They know where the resources are, who the rising stars are, what you know programs are coming down the pike. So it was somebody in their 40s who told me about the Ideas 42 Venture Studio. And I was 68 then and apply. 
see what happened. Mm -hmm. Do the spaghetti at the wall. And, you know, when I learned there, I think there were four rounds of interviews when it went from the second to the third, I, okay, let me pull my socks up here and pay attention. So um, openness to possibility, uh, not trying to make sense of things too soon. It, it may not look the way you thought it was look. The advice may not come from who you thought the advice would come from. Um, are you willing? I've had to change, get off the throne on this thing. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was some humbling that happened, you know, through this process. Uh, learning about kind of who in the friendship circle uh, lost some people that I would have not under no circumstances expected to lose and gain some people that, wow, I didn't know you were there for me like that. So it's just, you know, um, all of those things, I think uh, that's been the, the learning of these last several years. Yeah. I'm rocking like... Um... What's my girl from the color purple? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can I can relate to that. The and I can relate to, to so much of what you just said. Um what be, what would be the title of your autobiography? Hmm. She did it her way. I love that for you. I love that for you, especially knowing how you started from a place of shame in this and what the vulnerability of sharing um, has opened for you. Mm-hmm. And I've, you know, always... Um... I think when you grow up in America, what I call myself a little chocolate drop, okay, a little black girl, and you're not the paint by the numbers pretty, you know, you are not the consensus of what beauty is. You can go different directions. You can go into self-altering or self-loathing or self-hatred, or you can decide they don't like my round nose, I'm putting a diamond in the middle. They don't like my kinky hair, I'm going to wear it big. Big. Like, you know, and you just, I just went another way. And that has served me in so many circumstances of not, uh, you know, feeling like I have to fit, that I can be me and still go into those rooms. And I can still um, go in those rooms and get out of those rooms what I need to get. And I'm feeling like that because I'm not like totally altering myself to be there. And that has worked with me. You know, I've had so much affirmation of that over the years that it's the same with gray hair. It's, you know, I grew up, you know, it's before Lapita and Yango and all these you know, pitch black Sudanese models. And so we're in a different time now than you know, when I was 20. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I'll add to that where you said, knowing I can go in these rooms, refusing the go to go in the room. If I can't be me, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not going in the room. If I have to be someone else that, that clearly is not a room I need to be in. And that, I think that's a, a big, um, lesson. You know, I was, I learned recently that um, my grandson was accepted into Harvard Business School and did not go. Okay. And I was 
I had, I was, it was, it went from shock. No, it went from aghast, appalled, and then shock, and then awe. And the awe for me was um, when, now, he didn't ask my opinion, okay? Mm -hmm. I would have tried to talk him into it. But I think it is where you feel you don't need to do that to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a culture that says these are the union tickets to tax. Right. And um, and we see in young people, we don't maybe like all that they're doing, but we do see in them that um, there's some things they're not doing that we did. And you see it shifting. Uh, now, if you took two years off to do a gap year, uh, when I was growing up, that would have just looked irresponsible. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. What were, you know, you know, gap year. You're supposed to lockstep march, right. and they now open that up where if you went sailing for a year, that could actually look make you a Who more knows? interesting. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I um. That Harvard, <clears throat> Harvard piece, I always, and I was just talking about this with a friend yesterday with my daughter having gone to Harvard Law. And she also is a, she's, you know, of a different generation and space than your grandson. Obviously, I encouraged her to do all the things. But there was also some hardship that she experienced as part of doing that, like I um, the think piece I was just talking about with a friend of mine was <clears throat> her first few months there and her calling back um, in despair because she didn't feel like she should be there. And she was talking about how the the white bo white guys in her class knew all the answers and she didn't know the answers. So first we had to have a conversation around those answers aren't going to be in your head. Like you're insanely smart, but you're actually going to have to study because law is just not in your head. She was not used to having to study because she just stuff just came to her. So now you've got to change up and you've got to study and, and learn what that looks like for you. And then as she started studying, what she realized is they didn't know the answers. They were just throwing stuff out there. Like you always say, the spaghetti. They were just throwing stuff out there. And because this is what they do, they throw it out there. And the other guys in the classroom oh, exactly. back them right. up. And yeah. they'd all be wrong. But because they do that collective thing, they throw it out there. And it would seem to other people who hadn't, my daughter hadn't been studying. Oh, that sounds right. And they're backing each other up. And everybody's saying the same thing. So then she started learning. You're wrong. And I said, and that's absolute the preparation you're going to need for corporate America, because that's how they progress through life. They throw something out there and they make everybody else second guess what they think they know. And it's absolutely wrong. And then the second thing that of her Harvard experience, her very first year in going back after she had finished law school, going back for I don't know if they call it homecoming, for, but for I, I guess it is homecoming. Um Going back in the Harvard Black Law Association, she was a member of that, and a group of them go back and they get together and they're going to a club that weekend. And they get to the club and the it's a white club and the bouncer won't let them in. He says, oh. this, this looks like a group of thugs and we're not letting you in. No, no, no. The elitist of the elite, Harvard Law graduates, and you're you're not gonna let them in your club because you think they look like thugs. And it is so in in thinking about your grandson, you you do these things, you place yourself in these spaces because they're supposed to elevate you. And oftentimes it causes you causes you harm and it causes you trauma. And I appreciate and respect, um, even though you know I probably would have encouraged the same thing. You probably should go, but I appreciate and respect the HBCU movement 
and the right. and, and, and the fact that people, our young people, recognize I don't necessarily have to put myself in those spaces. Right. right. No, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, I feel like we're, somebody just said that about learning something from their daughter. I do feel like we're learning so much more from this younger generation, how they put themselves out there, the vulnerability, the acceptance, that all of the things that they do, that they don't have the same hangups that I know I have from, from growing up in my generation. And I, and I appreciate and respect that for them so much. And not having to be perfect. You know, they just put it out there, (laughs) see what happened, iterate, improve it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Elizabeth, we could be here all day. Tell, tell folks where they can find you and how they can support the work that you're doing. So one is to uh, follow along on Instagram, uh, the Elizabeth White Baking Normal. Uh, cause that's where I'm going to be talking about new age and kind of what's happening. Uh, there is a new age, uh, link on Instagram as well. You can follow along there. Um, and, um, my book is available on Amazon and I tell people I will, as time permits, it's 55 underemployed and faking normal. Uh, if you start a resilient circle, I have been known to drop in on a Zoom call. If you let me know in advance, and you know we can happy to participate in the discussion of a chapter. That's so. beautiful. That's beautiful. So I was ahead of the game today. So I already have um, both of those links in the description. I'm going to go in and add a link to the book, as well as add some information about Christine's book in the description. So that information is there. Um, I can say with a lot of confidence that this won't be the last um, that you see of Elizabeth on the channel. We're something we're, we'll, if, if not just catching up with each other and, and updates on what's going on um, there, there will be the yeah, connection absolutely. of the work that we do. So um I thank you so much. I knew when I reached out to you and asked you, um, would you do me the honor? I knew it was going to be fabulous. Um, this Our Sundays, I always share the story that I was looking at moving this conversation from Sundays to, to free up my time so I could attend brunch. And then I decided that I was going to keep it on Sunday and, and my soul collective, my, my audience that the, they call themselves the soul collective. This is, this is our church for, for us. These conversations um, yes. end up yes. church for us. And, um, and so I always know going into it, like when the, the guests, like this is going to be an excellent, excellent conversation conversation and it was and I thank you so so much for um for sharing your your um day with us um the other thing so I have said to um my group that there's some there's um the Eaton DC is um where we just were uh two weeks ago where they and I've shared it on Instagram if you don't follow me I shared some pictures um they did uh, a, a book um, a talk um, with Lynn Slater, um, Elizabeth and Christine were there. I am going to be doing an event at the Eaton. We're working on some of those details. So you'll get to see Elizabeth again around there, um, that event as well, because she is in the DC area. Um, so thank you all so much, Elizabeth. I thank you immensely. I can't, I can't say thank you enough for this. Well, well to be here. Um, and this is just the beginning. <laughs> so, absolutely. Thank you to the Soul Collective. Um, someone asked, "Was Elizabeth going to be at the Tiny House Festival speaking there?" The festival um, is speaking specifically to tiny houses, but will the DC event? Absolutely, I'll figure out how to to pull Elizabeth in there. She won't be at the Tiny House Festival. Um, There will be someone speaking to aging in place relative to tiny houses, and that's Bonnie. Bonnie was in our the audience last week, Um, so there is going to be a conversation there about um, aging in place and tiny houses. So um, look for that. And 
Thank you all so much. Um, I always, always, always appreciative to you all. I'm going to do my closeout. Elizabeth, hang on. Don't hold. Don't hang up. Let me do my closeout. And so collective. Thank you all so much. It was absolutely a fabulous um, conversation. And we'll talk again um, next next Sunday. So let me do my, they're all saying thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you is what was happening in the comments. So Elizabeth, thank you so much. Uh, let me change my screen. Oh, that's not where I was supposed to be. Here we go. Um, <laughs> technical difficulties are always my thing. So they just, they just let me be inept on all my technical stuff. Yeah. So thank you all so much for joining. This is, um, Miss Bohemian Soul TV. Um, thank y'all for participating. I, I know that you all got as much out of this conversation as I did. Um, I appreciate the um, conversation. I appreciate every one of you all's time. I will say, and Crystal and team always remind you all, if the video was helpful to you, to you, please like it, share it, tell your friends about it. So YouTube will see that folks love this content and they'll share it around and the, and the channel will grow. And all of those things, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notifications so that you'll know when content is live. And we will get together again next week. Um, a lot of folks are saying they're going to get your book. Uh, you'll absolutely appreciate it. Um, thank you all so much. And we'll talk again Sunday. You all have a great weekend. Be safe.